Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, if you're here for the Getting to Know You Icebreaker Ideas with the Smithsonian Learning Lab webinar, then you are in the right place. Uh, this is hosted by the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. And I'm Ashley Naranjo. I'm the manager for educator engagement here at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Darren Milligan. Darren, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi guys, hope everybody's well this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, as Ashley said, my name is Darren, and I'm the Senior Digital Strategist here at the Center for Learning and Digital Access. So I work with Ashley on our Learning Lab platform and uh, trying to make all the Smithsonian resources uh, more accessible and more usable by um, all of you out there in your classrooms and your, in your world. So we're excited to be here today. We're looking forward to um, talking to you. Absolutely. And so this webinar really came from a lot of conversations we've been hearing as teachers are getting, you know, kind of back, back to school and into um, the new school year and looking for ideas of ways to kick things off, ways to kind of go beyond the typical kind of dreaded icebreakers of, you know, A, my name is Ashley and I like apples and kind of going a little bit deeper with that, using digital tools, using uh, museum resources to be able to kind of expand upon the ways that you get to know your students. Yes, exactly. And I kind of hate icebreakers, but <laughs> I think the three examples that we're going to share today are uh, low pressure, low anxiety, very creative. Um, and I think we'll see sort of um, scale from kind of kind of pretty simple and pretty fun to kind of a lot kind of richer and, and deeper levels of engagement. So um, I think we're we're excited to kind of share all these sort of ideas with you. Absolutely. So um, as you're participating, as you're watching either the live session um, in YouTube, um, you can actually ask questions of us throughout. So this is certainly a conversation. Um, and if you're new to Google Hangouts, basically you just use the chat box to the right of the video for YouTube. Um, Smithsonian Education wrote a little note there, so hopefully it should be easy to find that chat box. And throughout the session, I'll be taking a peek at questions um, just to see um, if there's any questions you might have or um, comments or maybe icebreaker ideas that you want to share with us too um, oh, that's good yeah people have other ideas yeah I mean I think we've got three and we're gonna we're gonna race through them but I think uh, yeah if people have other ideas or ones you've tried um, we'd love to hear about that and share it with everyone else who's following uh, following along I think too just so everybody knows if you do have to jump off uh, a little early um, this is all being recorded and this will be available at the same link where you are now uh, or on the Smithsonian Education channel um, right after the broadcast. Sometimes it takes a few minutes, right, Ashley? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it should be available um, for you and uh, ready to ready to recap or to share around with your friends if you, if you hear some good ideas. Absolutely. Um, also, if you're in the Twitterverse, um, I know Darren and I like to let, share a lot of resources via the Smithsonian Lab twi uh, Twitter account. Um, so it's just Smithsonian Lab um, on Twitter. And often we share new resources that are coming out from our colleagues across the Smithsonian Institution, um, across subject areas and grade levels. But then we also share ways that teachers have shared with us um, interesting ideas for the classroom, um, innovative ideas, things that we might not have thought of um, and uh, just a great way to kind of keep you know uh, your hand on the pulse of what's going on with Smithsonian Learning Lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please let us let us know. We're we're always looking for that, and maybe if you suggest some things in the in the discussion tonight, we'll share those out tomorrow when we when we share this out too. So uh, let us know your thoughts. Great. So let's get started. We're ready, right? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of this big overarching question that we're asking ourselves is how are we going to be able to create opportunities for students to make connections? And when I say make connections, I mean both students making connections for, you know, connecting to their teachers, to their peers, but also to the value of using museum resources. So kind of what are those, you know, key nuggets within history or science, culture, the arts um, that get these students excited. And that might also help the trajectory of your lessons throughout the school year too. So if you know that kids are finding really interesting things within the learning lab, you might adjust the way that you uh, facilitate lesson plans or activities throughout the school year. All right. 
And all of the um, ideas that we're sharing today, we really thought about the ways that it might connect to the ISTE standards for students. Um, if you're not familiar with ISTE, it's the International Society for Technology and Education. And they have kind of these um, main competencies um, that students should be thinking about um, as they're creating new um, uh, products within um, a classroom. So for example, digital citizenship we hear about all the time um, for sure. Um, and these three projects um, that we're going to share with you today um, really fit into kind of knowledge constructor and creative communicator. And knowledge constructor really looks at how students curate and evaluate resources, um, how, do, how do they produce new things too, um, and make meaningful learning experiences for themselves. So it's really a student-centered kind of approach. Um, and then the other one that I would say too really fits in with all three of these activities is creative communicator. And again, these are across great bands and across um, subject areas too. And Creative Communicator just helps students think about how they can clearly and creatively express themselves um, in a variety of different purposes and platforms too. So um, keep an eye out as we're talking about these different icebreakers um, of, for ways that they might align to these two competencies specifically. I should say, too, we're going to put um, a link to the slides that you're seeing tonight uh, on the YouTube page following the uh, live event tonight. So you'll see there's going to be some specific examples we're going to share, as well as a link to those ISTE standards and some others. Um, so don't feel like you've got to scramble to write those down. We've got, we'll have got we have them in here, and they'll be linked out, so we'll have those ready for you. All right. So I think, I think most of you are probably familiar with the Smithsonian Learning Lab just because it's um, one of the main ways we've sort of promoted, uh, promoted this uh, webinar. Um, and the examples we're going to see tonight are, are um, ones using resources that are available from the lab. But we thought we'd spend just a minute kind of giving you um, just a little intro to the Learning Lab. So if you're not familiar with the Smithsonian Learning Lab, um, you can check it out now. It's at learninglab.si.edu. And it's a place where you can um, discover um, more than 3 million Smithsonian digital resources. So the, the Smithsonian is in the process of digitizing a lot of the things that you see in the museums, making them, uh, photographing them, and writing information about them so um, that you can access them anywhere in the world. So we've got just over 3 million of those things um, available now. And, and you know we're adding more and more stuff all the time. So we've got tens of thousands of videos. We've got image files, we've got music files, we've got all the articles from Smithsonian Magazine. These are all pulled together into one place at the Learning Lab. Um, but the lab is also a set of tools, and so beyond just finding and discovering these things, there's a whole series of tools that allows you to pull these things together um, and really turn them into digital learning experiences. And so some of the examples we are going to see tonight um, are, are using a lot of the tools of the Learning Lab to really begin to turn these individual things um, into actual um, uh, opportunities, I think. Right? So there's two kind of terms that Ashley and I are going to refer to as we walk through the lab tonight. The first one is resources. And so these are all the individual things, you know, an individual object from a museum, a video, um, a magazine, or a blog post article. All these things we refer to as resources. They're really the building blocks of what we would call collections. So collections is that other term. Um, it's important to sort of remember. And these are, um, and we have here sort of resources plus creativity equals collections. And so Ashley and I build collections in the lab, um, but there's really, there's more than um, 20,000 people out there in the world who are using the Smithsonian Learning Lab to build these collections. And these are, um, you know, made by educators here at the museum, um, people who work across all of our museums, but they're also made by teachers out in the classroom and also made by students. So we're going to actually see some examples, at least one example of that later, Ashley, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, as we begin to dive into what those resources are, I imagine I, I mentioned art, but it's art and photographs and artifacts. There's recordings, there's specimens, there's texts. There's, you know, the Smithsonian's a big, big place, and so what what you'll find there crosses um, disciplines from history, art, science, and culture. So it's really a huge resource bank of um, trusted content that's uh, there and uh, kind of ready for for you to to take advantage of. So if you're not familiar, um, check it out. It's a completely free platform. Um, we do ask that you create an account if you want to start building those collections, but if not, you can access everything, especially everything we're going to show you tonight, um, without having to create uh, an account. I think we're ready 
to break the ice. Are we, am I right, Ashley? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the, the first icebreaker idea that we have um, is called My Smithsonian Closet. And this actually came um, from a very creative teacher that we've worked with. Um, she's an AP US history teacher um, who's taught in both North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Um, and so Kate Harris came up with this great idea to just kind of break the ice as far as helping students think about um, you know, uh, kind of the, the idea of a Smithsonian closet and what that might entail, right? And so at first, the idea seems pretty simple. You might search for something like dress or suit. Um, but then what I love about this is it kind of forces you to think outside the box to kind of get more creative to find that one object that really kind of stands out. And so there were two examples up on the screen, one from Kate and one from Darren. Um, and so um, he's pulling it up actually live from, from the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Yeah, this is the live version. This is Kate, uh, the creator of this idea. This is her Smithsonian closet I just pulled up in the, in the Learning Lab. So this is a Learning Lab collection we're looking at here. Absolutely. And so you can see that it's a highly visual experience. Um, the resources, the images of those resources, you can kind of hover over and see what the titles are. Um, ooh, those are kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can kind of navigate back to the grid to see the collection as a whole. So you can see those individual resources from the museums as well as the collections as a whole. Um, and what I love about this is it kind of forces you to think outside the box of the typical search terms to get to things like jewelry. This is one of my favorite examples, too, that she's included. It's Patsy Cline's costume. And what's nice about these images is you can zoom in to look at the detail, um, and you can see kind of the patches on the top of her costume. And then what's nice is once you find a resource like this, and you're, you know, maybe students don't know who Patsy Cline is, or maybe they're kind of intrigued by um, the handiwork that's on there, they can open up that artifact information and get a description of um, a metadata description from the museum, um, which includes a lot of details um, about context and why the Smithsonian might have it, um, as well as some kind of food for thought as far as next steps if students wanted to go a little bit deeper with this. So I love this as part of Kate's Smithsonian closet. I think it's super unique and also shares a little bit too about how Kate might curate um, a closet of her own. Mm -hmm. um, I love her Campbell's Soup uh, super dress, I think it's called, uh, S-O-U-P-E-R. That's kind of a fun one too to, to take a peek at. Um, and again, you can zoom in and out, high resolution images. Um, you can also see multiple images on some of these resources sources too. Um, so she did a few different um, searches to come up with these and then she chose the ones that she liked and she put them into a collection. It's a simple collection but I think this also offers an opportunity for students to start to kind of build on some of the skills that you're hoping for as far as research goes. Um, things like mind mapping for sure. Um, and then what I like too is that students could either publish these or share the URL with the class. They could um, certainly put them up on, you know, a blog or social media, whatever you might, you know, choose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you could even do just like a gallery walk where everybody leaves their devices open and, you know, asks a few questions about what are those interesting objects that you found and why did you choose them? Yeah, I think the possibilities in this are so fun because, you you know, I mean, if you really are into shoes, your closet could just be shoes. I mean, we've <laughs> got a lot, of, a lot of objects. And so there's this great potential for this kind of anybody finding their pathway into kind of thinking about clothing, thinking about online research skills, thinking about, like, as, as Ashley said, you know, it might not be clothing, it might be costume. They're the kind of ways of um, um, getting at some of the um, online research skills that I think we probably all, all of us struggle with kind of really, um, you know, getting, getting a handle on. Um, go back here. So that's Kate's closet, and she's yeah. the, the kind of creator of this idea. But what's nice about this is Darren was actually able to riff off of her idea um, and create his own. And so what, that's why we're sharing you sharing with you these two examples of what this could look like. Um, so here, Darren's done a really nice job, if I do say so myself, of yeah. also yeah. including things like artwork, too. So I see a lot of William H. Johnson, for example. I see some stamps, too. Um, so he's kind of thought outside of the box again, too, with not just artifacts and objects. I might need to rethink this. Image. 
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would love to see you come to the office in that, <laughs> that outfit. <laughs> um, <Maybe> tomorrow. <laughs> that too is kind of interesting too. I, I'm curious, how did you find the the kind of silver, it looks kind of futuristic boot over yeah, right. that one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think when you see this, especially maybe after after seeing it in context of this stamp from the oh, the U.S. Postal Service, we have a stamp on '70s fashion. That's <laughs> very interesting. But you know, it looks almost like a kind of a disco boot, right? And it's probably why I first sort of saw it. I was probably searching for boots, um, and I found this. Um, but actually, when you read the information, you realize it's something very different. Um, Oh, interesting, yeah. yeah. So this was actually worn by um, an astronaut during the Mercury mission in uh, May of uh, 1962. So, um, you know, I think some of the objects, um, you know, that you might traditionally think of where clothing might be at the Smithsonian, like the National Museum of American History, um, we have a lot of spacesuits, and they're really, really cool. Um, this one sort of is really early in the space program, so it kind of crosses the line between you know, fashion and, and space flight. Right? Yeah, and that kind of functional purpose too, um, even just talking about what the soles were made out of and the type of fabric that was used, um, things that we might see, you know, the zippers and the laces and the buckles. Yeah, and the I just noticed that. Like, <laughs> There's like a lot of like- not opening. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so thinking about both the functions of these shoes, for example, or, you know, clothing that you have within your, your closet, but then also thinking about the people who wore these, right? Um, the paintings, the portraits that you've included, and the stories behind those as well. I think this also kind of gets me excited as I'm looking at the ways that you've curated this, because there's some questions too of why you might have chose these specific objects. Um, and maybe they were just visually pleasing, but some of them might have you know personal connections too that can start a great conversation um, without feeling too intimidating, I would say. Um, I love that MTV t-shirt too kind of nostalgic uh, of the 80s and 90s. So yeah, it looks a, like you were going through a decades type closet. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, I think most of the things were looking pretty formal. So I was like, you know, I need to find some t-shirts or something <laughs> like you know, that actually looks more like what I'm usually wearing. Right, right. Days. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So those are two examples of how people have curated uh, the, the kind of theme of my Smithsonian closet. Um, want to take a look to, um, so that was kind of the, the boot and Patsy Cline's costume. Um, and so I love the way that uh, uh, Kate described her collection. She said, you could be exceptionally well-dressed if the Smithsonian were your closet. But digging a little bit deeper into these collections, I wanted to point out that there were some search skills that we talked about, right? So you had to refine your search. You couldn't just kind of type in closet and the first things that you found would be in your closet. You had to kind of think outside of the box and um, really mind map the types of things. So if you had just typed shoes, you might have gotten something different than boots um, or sneakers or you know a, a number of different types of um, those types of articles of clothing. So it starts to help kids think about refining their search, but in a way that's more fun um, than a typical, you know, activity about mind mapping. I also love um, the ideas of both kind of historical connections, biographical connections, artistic connections, cultural connections. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, using these resources to then kind of be a building block and a pathway towards um, the types of activities you create throughout the year, um, knowing that your students have these specific interests. And I love about that. I mean, I've, I've seen you know, students do an activity where they, they're finding um, objects from cultures that might not be their own and things that they might not normally sort of gravitate to or just even be in their sort of sphere of awareness. And it's these little entryways, you know, as they find a really cool jersey or a really cool um, jacket or an artwork of, of, of beginning to kind of experiment a little bit with other cultures and becoming more aware of, of kind of the, the greater world. And so it's, it's a really kind of fun way and a very casual, low impact, really easy, um, really approachable way of kind of getting started and just talking, kind of talking about identity, but in a very low pressure kind of way. 
Absolutely, absolutely. We also have Lori who mentioned um, in the chat um, a kind of fun little spinoff too for perhaps science classes or even just um, interests outside of, of fashion, so to speak, and identity um, would be my insect collection. So um, what are the insects that you choose um, say about you? And I love that um, because the Smithsonian has, gosh, how many uh, insects within our collection? Oh, I, this is being recorded, so I don't want to be quoted, but I think it's about 90% of our collection. Wow. Are insects, or at least objects in the Natural History Museum, and our collection has over 150 million individual objects. Wow. So about millions and millions and millions of insects. So I love that idea of sort of kind of beginning to find ways of um, representing yourself or, or your interests or the things you like, but through through another animal. That's a really cool idea, Lori. Sure, and as we're thinking about this, I'm curious too, um, Lori asks what grades we might recommend um, for my Smithsonian closet. Um, you know, I think Kate is, has worked in secondary classrooms specifically, um, but this might also be an opportunity to differentiate the activity. So for example, you might as a class go together and mind map and brainstorm what are those words that we should search so that the students aren't having to kind of go on their own to figure that out. You could do that as a group and then allow for some kind of curation and selection. Um, that's my take as far as just, you know, maybe some of the elementary grades might need some more help with that piece of thinking about what are those search terms that are good. Um, maybe high school students could get really creative with it and kind of go wild with it um, uh, and go a little bit deeper perhaps too. I know- I could really see middle and high school kids in working sort of independently to sort of really craft their closet and something that they're going to want to show off to their friends and sort of show in class as a representation of kind of their their brand, right? Yeah, I right. Can oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, All right. So shall we move on to idea two or do we, are we ready? Yeah, idea, idea two works. Let's, um, so we've done the Smithsonian closet, which is, again, a low risk activity. It kind of starts out um, with just kind of searching for specific things that are of interest within your closet and mind mapping those. Um, the second activity that we'll talk about um, was actually introduced to me by a colleague, an educator from the Heinz History Center, which is a Smithsonian affiliate museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and a Pittsburgh native, he's a pop artist, um, Burton Morris, um, has a series of paintings that he calls the nightstand portraits. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, I would love for anyone to kind of guess in the chat if there's any ones that stand out to them. Um, for example, in the bottom right, um, we have Sherlock Holmes. And so there's a magnifying glass, there's a pocket watch, there's a candle, there's a pipe, there's that iconic hat, um, and there's a book too. So that's, that's Sherlock Holmes. Um, there's also some superheroes perhaps. Um, yeah, right across the top, right? Yeah, yeah and, and superheroes and supervillains, I would say mm -hmm. too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, kind of iconic Popeye, um, we've got Andy Warhol, Mickey Mouse, Iron Man, mm -hmm. um, Tim, Tim Allen in the corner who played uh, Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story. So um, some really interesting uh, paintings that represent people, but are not your typical portrait. Um, so right away, Way we can kind of guess who these people are based on these objects, um, but they're not the typical kind of portrait of your face or um, kind of that literal piece. They're really kind of iconic objects that help identify that person as who they are, um, what they represent, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving to the next slide, we took this idea and um, also have kind of an inspired activity where students could search the learning lab um, and find five iconic objects that really kind of help represent who they are. Um, and so I had a little bit of fun with this one too. Um, I chose five objects that you're seeing on your screen right now too. Um, I chose sneakers. I run um, a lot of races. And so what was nice about this was as I 
I started to put together um, this collection, um, I also used, um, so this is just an example of, of what you'll see as you're searching. Um, and again, this could even go in my Smithsonian closet too, right? Um, but <laughs> what's nice about this is I also was able to provide a rationale for the choices that I made. So here I just added an annotation, which is very easy to do. Um, as you're adding resources, you can also customize um, to include some info text um, alongside your image. Um, and so here I just, um, shared kind of how this is representative of a hobby that I have of running races. I've run the Cherry Blossom 10 miler. I've run the Navy Air Force half marathon a few times and actually uh, three weeks from now I'm also running it too. So um, that'll be interesting. <laughs> it's been a busy summer, so hopefully I'll get some training in soon. <laughs> um, the rock and roll half marathon, etc. So that was one object. That's a hobby that I have. I kind of brainstormed through how, what types of activities I wanted to include. I also included things like this stamp that has the, the quote, letters mingle souls. I'd love to write handwritten um, notes to people, thank you notes. It's kind of like my thing. People know me by that. Um, and so I was able to kind of um, include that piece as well. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this. I recognize this. <laughs> this is the National Museum of American History. It's Seinfeld's puffy shirt. I watch a lot of reruns for some reason. I don't know why I still pay for cable, but um, in, in this uh, example too, I included the puffy shirt just as kind of something fun. Um, it's, you know, the show about nothing, right? So included that as well. Um, and then also included um, a Kurt Vonnegut uh, portrait that was on my nightstand, literally on my nightstand. There was a book that I was reading um, right when, when I created this. And then finally, I had two black labs growing up. Um, and so I included that too. So these are just kind of little clues that people could then ask me about, um, you know, and maybe we have a connection, maybe, you know, Darren runs too. And so then that's something that we can start to talk about. Um, and so really just a way though for students to A, choose just five. So different from the Smithsonian closet where you could kind of have this endless, you know, um, shopping budget, so to speak. Here we're asking you to start to really carefully select and hone which are those five objects that if someone saw this, they would totally understand who you are, what your hobbies are, and have some ideas too about how they might interact with you um, and what they might chat about with you. Yeah, and I love the part where you annotate um, and you sort of document what it is. So I, and I think, you know, you can sort of see from the from the Smithsonian closet version of this just sort of a bunch of things, not really ordered, not really sort of, you know, not your favorite first and your least favorite. I mean, it's just a bunch of things that could be in your closet, maybe as random and messy as our closets might be, to, to this, which is this really much more carefully thought out thing. And then, uh, you know, a bit of a writing activity to to document and to explain why these things represent you. What about you do they represent? And making that, um, if, if, you know, if a teacher or the student chose, it could be a very public sort of demonstration that could be out there, published on the lab, um, could be something they could share with each other or share back to the teacher. And so it really becomes an assignment, a response, a documentation of that that kind of learning process. I really like that. Yeah, I think too the reflection piece was also important because it helps you in that process of why did I choose this specific image over another? Um, and what does this say about me? And I know someone in our chat also mentioned um, including the notes is just a great idea too. Um, it allows you to kind of go a little bit deeper than we did in the first activity. Um, I also wanted to show an example that a student created so I'm not the only one who has a nightstand portrait in the Smithsonian. Um, so we have a student's representation. Um, and what I love about this is not only did he use um, Smithsonian objects, so that last one is a Team USA hockey jersey, but he also had the opportunity to upload specific um, objects or dogs. Um, <laughs> 
favorite pets, his dirt bike, um, his own hockey jersey, which I love kind of the connection between the Team USA jersey and his own. Um, and here he kind of wrote a short description too. Um, I believe this is a fifth grade student too. Um, and so kind of learning how to um, create for an audience, um, a game controller. And I love that, you know, he has a specific type of drink that he likes to have um, as well, the sweet tea. So, um, so yeah, so it's just another example of how students are actually able to not only use what the Smithsonian has to offer, but also be able to upload those personal objects as well that complement um, the Smithsonian's collection. And that's something that you can do um, not only for this activity, but also across, um, you know, as you're creating collections, both for lessons um, or, or student responses, that sort of thing. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. And so as we kind of switch to teacher hat and kind of debrief <laughs> what it is that we just did within that nightstand collection, I talked about this a little bit, um, but the idea of selection and curation. Um, so specifically choosing those resources. Um, we've been talking to a lot of curators this past summer. And one of the things as they're curating new exhibits, they have a ton of stuff um, to be able to kind of choose from. And so how are they choosing that narrative that they're sharing within an exhibit? It. And this is really an exhibit about you, right? Um, so really kind of carefully choosing those specific things that you want to share um, with the group. And again, I think it's kind of this low risk thing where you get to choose what's important to you um, and, and share it with the group. Um, they can also be conceptual or literal, depending on the, the age range, you start to see kind of some, some mm -hmm. more kind of conceptual responses too. Um, so, in your example, right? So you had Seinfeld puffy shirt. I mean, you don't have a shirt laying over your thing, right. but it's conceptual. There are a bunch of items that really just kind of help to explain, um, you know, who, who you are or what you're really interested in. So I, I love that. That can be that nice spectrum. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, and then we've also had students who have put like, literally, I have a lamp and I have a book and I have, um, you know, different things, pictures of my family. Um, so being able to kind of differentiate between that conceptual and literal, I think is, is kind of interesting too. Um, so as we're going through, um, we've also got, let's see, we, we talked about conceptual and literal. We talked about how it's curation. Um, there's also the ability to annotate the descriptions, which I thought was really interesting too, um, to be able to have like a reflective moment to share your um, responses and um, it, to kind of think about why you chose those specific items, almost like a, a museum label um, as to why it's important. Um, and then the last piece too is uploading personal objects. So what I love about that um, is the ability to be able to not only include museum objects from the Smithsonian, but to start, start to curate your own types of personal objects and affects. So um, I thought that was a really fun part of this activity. I, I love that too. Actually, I'm gonna have a, a, a housekeeping question for you. Sure. Can you still see the slides? Um, so I don't, I see. Okay. Um, just the Smithsonian logo. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask you to fill some time for a second. We had a weird little technical thing happen here, so I'm going to try to get us going here with some... Okay, sure. Um, Actually, this might be a good time for me to take a peek at the chat. Um, so we talked about including the notes is a great idea. Um, we also had a comment about finding items on the site and then snapping photos on a field trip scavenger hunt is also a great idea. Um, so I love that. And then we, oh, yep. Yeah. So I think you've got the screen up now. Yes. Um, and then the last one, um, folks asked, do we have any 3D images that students mm -hmm. can manipulate? Um, Darren, do you want to answer that? We do. Um, yeah, we've got a whole office at the Smithsonian that's working on creating 3D models of uh, lots of our objects. Um, the best way to see them right now is to go to 3D.si.edu. Um, we do have uh, the models available, uh, some of the models available in the lab sort of sprinkled through some of the collections, um, but the really the best way to check them out is to go over to 3d.si.edu. As they add new models and they all, they all show up uh, in, in there, so that's a, that's a great way. We've got ooh, maybe more than 100 models now, but some really cool stuff, and they're, they're uh, digitizing a lot of cool things there, so you can check those out there. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think the Wright Flyer is one of them. Um, they've got sure. Amelia Earhart's flight suit too. Um, so really interesting stuff that could also, you could take the URL of the 3D images and include them within your collection as well. So there's kind of both the 2D images, the videos, but then also those 3D collections. It's a smaller collection, um, more in the hundreds, I would say. Is that about right? That's um, right. Yeah. And as Ashley said, if you're, if you're kind of a power user on the Learning Lab, you can grab Grab the URL at 3d.si.edu of the actual object you're looking at and include that as a resource in your collection. Um, if that's a bit uh, in the future for your uh, for your deep usage, you can always tweet us at Smithsonian Lab, um, and we can uh, we can get back to you with some specifics on how to grab those if you want to pull them right into the lab. Absolutely. Well, All right. Great. I think we're ready to go to the slides. We're back back online, so I'm going to switch back over to the slides, and we can jump into the third. Our third example, which I think I think you'll sort of see the funnel here of kind of wide open creativity, the more careful thought and curation and annotation to something even more creative. Absolutely. So for this uh, last one, I should give total props um, to the National Museum of American History. Back in 2012, um, they had an exhibition called Portraits Unbound, um, and a photographer, Robert Weingarten, um, actually created these portraits um, of well-known figures. Um, for example, on the screen now, you'll see um, a portrait quote unquote, of Hank Aaron, um, and so the famous uh, famous American baseball player. Um, and so what I love about this is the photographer, Robert Weingarten, he had um, celebrities write a letter to them, to him, explaining what are the five most important objects, and you're kind of seeing a theme here. Burton Morris also chooses five specific objects too. Um, and these can be anything throughout their life though. So what's interesting about Robert Weingarten's portraits is they don't span just one time period or one place like most portraits do. Often they are kind of this like retrospective. So from the beginning of your life to current day, what are those five iconic moments in time um, and, and kind of historical pieces of your own history? Um, and so what I love about this, you can see there's the baseball stadium there. Um, there's also a jersey um, and there's the B&O railway car too. Um, and so as he was traveling as a baseball player, um, there was a lot of uh, segregation happening at that time. And so the railway car was how he got across the country and where he stayed most of the time was in the railway car. So kind of demonstrating his success, um, but also some of the challenges that he faced throughout his career. Um, so I really love that. Um, it's representational, right? So it's certainly not um, specifically, you know, what kids are most used to seeing when they think about portraits. Um, and so I love that what he's done is kind of taken photographs of these iconic um, moments in Hank Aaron's life, um, but then collage them and kind of layered them digitally. Um, so, you know, you can look up and down uh, the image, you can look left to right, but you can also kind of look depth wise as far as kind of the layers um, within the portrait. And so I think for that reason, it's just especially interesting to think about how he's curated this specific image. Mm -hmm. Um, also during this time, um, he actually, um, the, the photographer had um, kind of a contest with the museum too, and folks voted on who should be the next person that he features. And um, if you kind of happen to know a little bit about salsa, you might have guessed that this image here um, is Celia Cruz. Um, and so in the bottom right, you can see that she has her um, salsa shoes. Um, there's also kind of these wonderful, colorful costumes as well. But then also layered over is her marriage license too. Um, so I, I just love the way that um, he's kind of incorporated multiple aspects um, of her life into one image. Um, and I really love that. I mean, considering the individual objects on their own, you really, be, they begin to become this new object, right? This new kind of visual. And like you said, that depth is such a, such a, such a visual way of kind of thinking about a portrait that doesn't actually have a picture of, of Celia Cruz. It's really, really interesting. Absolutely. All right. 
So what I like about this too is um, the American History Museum had actually written a series of blogs and those are also going to be available um, within uh, the links that we provide to you too. So you can take a peek at the teacher's processes. But um, one of the teachers did a, a See, Think, Wonder. And so See, Think, Wonder is kind of one of the, the mainstays of Harvard University's Project Zero thinking routines. Um, these are often sim seemingly simple um, <laughs> conversation starters. So, it, you know, it, the, the questions go kind of in the line of what do you see? What do you think about that? And what does it make you wonder? Um, and what's nice about these, though, is while they're seemingly simple, a lot of times you kind of start to, um, if you let the conversation go on long enough, people start to notice they do some slow looking and they start to notice extreme details that they might not have noticed if they just kind of looked at an image. Image. Um, someone had told me that the average person in a museum spends about six seconds in mm. front of a given object or, or artwork. And so kind of slowing down, taking a step back and really kind of concentrating on what you're seeing. So that's observation. And then what you think about that and what it makes you wonder, that's interpretation and curiosity. Um, and so helping students also kind of, you know, you can use chart paper or whatever you might like, um, you know, kind of written on the board annotate what are those things that students are noticing what are those details and then what are the the kind of evidence and interpretation that they're using to then come up with what they think about that um, so that's just one example of how to use project zero routines um, but what I like about this is this is an entry point too so there's actually several um, uh, project zero thinking routines we've got on our website um, a collection full of them so that you can just pick and choose what might work best for you. Um, there's everything from things like observation to justification, um, and there's specific routines that um, demonstrate specific thinking and lines of thinking and understanding that you might be interested in. We've found they pair especially well with museum resources. Um, lots of conversation starters, something you could do throughout the school year too. Um, and sometimes some of the best collections are really ones that go deep within one image and really kind of ask a lot of questions about that one image. Um, so something to consider, um, that's also available on the Learning Lab as well. But going back to the actual activity itself, um, the American History Museum had within their blog post examples from students of what those five objects were that they had chosen. Um, and what I love about this is this is kind of the literal example. They kind of arranged them in, in a photograph and then took a picture of them. Um, I think students at kind of the secondary level might be able to play around with some photo editing software, maybe some Photoshop. Um, they could include images of their own. They could include um, Smithsonian objects too. The Smithsonian objects are downloadable, so you could start to kind of manipulate them um, as well and create a new collage that demonstrates who you are. Um, so I really love this, this kind of idea. And again, I have to give credit to the National Museum of American History. This idea went along with an exhibition um, from Robert Weingarten called Portraits Unbound. It's so nice, too, I think, that, that students out there, if you're doing this activity, could see his work as as really examples and as Ashley said could use Photoshop or other you know image editing software that can be found online to begin to layer these things together and think about what what goes in front and what goes behind and think about that depth um, in their design of their work and kind of what that what that really means and what they're sort of talking about in their new object in this kind of new creation it's um, it's a really exciting activity so I, I actually hope some people who are uh, tuned in now will try that out and share some of their images back because you can sort of see the example we have are, are, you know, the students actually brought in the objects into the room and, and photographed them. Um, but we'd love to see some student work of, that are sort of digital, digital works that are more in the style of, of the artist. It'd be really cool. Absolutely. And I love that some of them are very related. I think this was at a time when, when the Hunger Games was especially pretty popular. You can see that in a few of, of the co um, collections that students have have included, um, but also just, yeah, uh, but also thinking about the interplay of how these objects work together, the moments in time. Um, I love that, you know, Hank Aaron's portrait, for example, does span a, a period of time, um, kind of a retrospective looking back. Um, and I could certainly see students also taking kind of a step back and saying, you know, how far have I gotten in the progress that I've made, um, you know, as a fifth grader, let's say, um, and what was life like when I was a first grader or when I was 
just coming new to a school for the first time or what types of sports have I played or hobbies do I have? Um, you know, those kinds of questions that could really get students starting to think about that and then also share out um, connections that they might have. Mm -hmm. So for this activity, um, what I like about this especially is that um, with Portraits Unbound, what makes you who you are, um, you can actually apply Project Zero thinking routines to the original artwork that it's based off of. Um, so that also gets kids thinking of like the photographer, like the, the artist, um, and so kind of applies those questionings and inquiry skills into um, the, the introduction of those photographs. Um, it also connects the physical and digital especially well. Um, so as you're taking photos of your favorite stuffed animal or your favorite book, um, you're also kind of experimenting with what that might look like um, and kind of the positioning and the lighting and the zoom and, and all of those details that you might want to feature. Um, and then it's also expanding students' idea of portraiture. So often, a lot of times, people um, don't love having their picture taken, um, or if they do, it's a selfie and <laughs> it's especially posed. Um, and so this is a different approach. It's um, it's not time bound. It's not place bound, um, and it's beyond just that physical representation of who a person is. Um, so I love this as kind of just again um, that representational um, portraiture. Um, that we're, we've been talking about too. It, you know, it's interesting. I could even you could even sort of see someone doing all three of these and the sort of funneling down of lots of stuff that kind of represent me to five objects that are really a portrait of me in many ways and that I annotate to then an, a new creative work, an actual portrait of myself. Um, I love that the kind of possibilities and sort of seeing how these could work independently, but also. Um, Kind of be that progress right absolutely absolutely um and then also to kind of look back on your work too you know at the beginning of the year we started with the my smithsonian closet and here's how far we've come as well um so kind of showing that progression throughout the the digital works that students have created um yeah cool Bye. I'll ask too, um, if folks have any questions of things that we've mentioned along the way, please feel free to um, use this time for questions and answers. I've loved some of the comments that um, everyone's shared in the chat box. Um, so really great questions so far have been about, you know, the 3D, um, what grade levels we would suggest, how we might differentiate some of these activities. Um, Everything that we've talked about today is actually included in a blog post on the Smithsonian Learning Lab. So often, similar to social media, we'll feature specific case studies, stories um, from the classroom, or ideas from our museum educators. And so this is actually a blog post that I wrote um, about breaking the ice, and it features um, Kate Harris's Smithsonian Closet, Darren Milligan's Smithsonian Closet as well. Um, they're embedded onto the blog post, so you can actually see the objects within the blog post um, and then also some context for each of those activities as well um, so um, something to be able to share you can also see that last um, example there's blog posts from the teachers who have actually done that activity as well so um, lots of you know links to be able to check out um, and the examples that were featured um, in tonight's webinar so that's at learninglab.si.edu and if you click on news and breaking the ice you'll be able to find it um, and we'll be able to we'll be sure to, to tweet about it um, next time too. I'll double check um, if there's any other comments. Cool. Well, Ashley is doing that. I'll just um, do a little a little pitch for um, we've been thinking about ways that we can um, better support um, all of our great users who are building really amazing collections out there and, and uh, using Smithsonian digital resources in, in their classrooms and in their lessons. And um, so in September, we're starting up uh, office hours every Tuesday from 4 to 5 Eastern time. Um, Ashley or myself or another member of the Learning Lab team uh, will be available in a format just like this, um, just here without a program really, just here to uh, answer questions, to uh, build a collection together if you want to ha have some help to show you some more in-depth features um, of, of the lab um, to help you find some resources that might work or to kind of think about ways um, that uh, you might be able to use the tool or all the resources uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more meaningful way. So um, information about that is available on the site in our about in our uh, event section. Um, there's a link if you are on the home page of Learning Lab and you scroll to the bottom you'll see that also. Um, but that's uh, all available there, and uh, we'll we'll start that off uh, the first Tuesday of September.
Absolutely. So I know in DCPS, um, the District of Columbia's public schools, we started school yesterday. So um, lots of kids kind of walking around my neighborhood, getting excited and getting pumped for the beginning of the school year. I know some local schools in Virginia start um, in a few weeks um, and some schools start even after Labor Day. But we would love to hear from you if you use any of the ideas um, that we've shared today um, or if you come up with new ones. We'd love to um, hear how the Smithsonian Learning Lab has been helpful to you um, in getting to know your students and helping them make connections and building their research skills. I think what's nice about the Learning Lab is it's just so flexible. It's over 3 million digital resources that are from the museums that have great metadata to describe them. Um, and they're really high resolution images. So you can start to kind of um, hone in on specific topics, um, not only just icebreakers, of course, um, that's what the theme of today's webinar is, but it's certainly something that can be used across the curriculum. Um, you can use the refined search tools um, to find specific collections based on your subject area or grade level too. So you can see what other teachers have created on a given topic. Um, so something to, to think about. Yeah, um, as Ashley said, we'd love to see it. So if you, if you, if you do any of these activities or if you, um, you sort of break off and come and, and come up with your own uh, cool alternative, um, you know, tweet at us at Smithsonian Lab or um, on the Learning Lab, there's a contact us um, link on every single page. There's a little question mark in the lower right hand corner of every, every page on the Learning Lab. And you can send us a message and we'd, we'd love to see what you're doing and, and get inspired by you as we are almost every day when we're looking <laughs> making. So uh, please make sure to share what you've made with us too. Absolutely. And with that, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, webinar that we've had, you know, with you all. Um, I'm grateful to, to one of the commenters who says the Smithsonian is a huge part of her classroom instruction, um, her or his, I apologize. Um, and so thank you um, for including us in your classroom. Um, there's really no greater compliment. So we're thrilled to hear that um, and That's keep great. sharing uh, all of your different ideas with us on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Really enjoyed talking with you tonight. We'll see you online soon.